Thank you for joining our church online. We encourage you to visit citylightla.church for our service times, location, and upcoming events. If you enjoy our videos and would like to give to lives being changed in Los Angeles, visit citylightla.church slash give. Man, I tell you what, I just love, love, love singing together as a congregation. It is absolutely one of my favorite things to do. It ministers to my heart every single time that we do it. I love music. Music in particular just has uh, the power to just change your mood. Uh, we just want to lift those praises to God. I love those songs that we, we sing. I love in particular singing about the resurrection. Um, that resurrection gets me fired up. I tell you what, um, I, hope you, I hope you never get over the resurrection. I hope you never get over that. That is the crowning jewel of our faith. When you look at Christianity, you say, why is Christianity true? And all these other religions are not because we have a resurrected king. And that gets me excited every time that we sing it. And so I, I just get, we're going to have one more after this. You're going to hear me get pumped up one more time. I don't care if I, if I sound bad, I'm just going to let it rip anyway. So that's, that's just how I do it. If you ask Will Shepherd if he's somewhere, he loves the way I sing. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to be picking up where, where Pastor Nick left off last week. We're going to be in verses 9 through 12. So as you're uh, finding your way there, I'd ask you to just keep Pastor Nick in your prayers. Keep our leadership team in your prayers. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be driving to Arizona. Pastor's already on his way. We're going to a church conference just to kind of strengthen us, renewing us for this uh, uh, season of ministry that we're about to go in. Uh, we're never content with where we are as a church. We always want to get better. We always want to try to push forward because we really believe heaven and hell is on the line. And we believe as we get better, more people will be drawn here, hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we can push forward. So you be praying for us. As you're finding your way into 1 Thessalonians, I'm just going to give us a little bit of context of of what's happening in the Thessalonican church, um, just to kind of set the stage and just kind of a reminder of where we're at. So in the Thessalonican church, that church was started by Paul and Silas. If you read in the book of Acts, if you read in the books, uh, you know, chapter 16, 17, 18 in the book of Acts, you'll see that Paul and Silas went to Thessalonica. They began to preach the gospel. People began to get saved and they birthed the local church. But persecution then came upon Paul and Silas, as it did in many of the cities they went to, and they were literally trying to kill them, trying to stone them, so they had to leave Thessalonica early, and that left the Thessalonican believers with some, some unanswered questions. They did not have the complete New Testament as we would have today, to where we can just say, hey, what, what does they mean by that? Let me open up the Bible. Let me look that up. They didn't have that convenience for them. So what Paul did was he sent, as we learned a couple weeks ago when, when Pastor was preaching through and he sent Timothy, remember he said, he sent, I sent you my best. I gave you my best. I didn't just send anyone. I sent my best disciple along with you and that was Timothy. Timothy came back to Paul and he gave them this report. He said, you know what, Paul, the Thessalonican church is doing well. They're doing well in their faith. They're doing well with loving others. Um, but they have some unanswered questions. And in particular, a lot of those unanswered questions had to deal with the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's why if you look at the theme of the book of 1 and 2 Thessalonians, it's got a, a theme of end times. You'll see a lot of stuff in there about that. The theological term there is eschatology. So you'll, you'll, you'll see that that is a lot of the theme that's here. And so what Paul is writing to them is to answer some of those questions and then also give them some instruction on how to live properly, how to thrive, how to stay strong and live ready as you're waiting for that return of Christ, as you're anticipating that return of Christ. How do we thrive? How do we stay strong? How do we live ready? So that's kind of the, the, the theme of our sermon series here is we're going verse by verse and line by line through the word of God. And we see in particular here in our text in verses 9 through 12, we get to the topic of brotherly love. The topic of brotherly love. So how does brotherly love help me thrive? How does brotherly love help me to stay strong and live ready? At first glance, maybe when you read this, you, you may not say, you know what? How, how does that have anything to do with me thriving? How does me loving one another have anything to do with me thriving and staying strong and giving me hope as a Christian? Well, I'm going to try to explain that as we break down the passage today. And hopefully, through the Holy Spirit of God and through his word, you'll be able to walk away with this, being able to be encouraged, not only to love each other, but also see how that's going to make your life stronger. Let's go ahead and dive into our text, verse 9 of our text. Now concerning, so 
Last week we learned about how holiness and righteousness can produce a life that thrives. So now Paul's changing topics. It's now concerning brotherly love. When you see brotherly love in scripture, that's tying, that's talking directly to scripture among, or talking about love between Christians. Brotherly love. It's the idea of, uh, we get the, Gre- the Greek word is phileo. We get our word Philadelphia from that, the city of brotherly love. Right? So whenever you see that, it, the, so that sets the context. We're talking about how we love each other in this room. How Christians are to love each other. Continuing on. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed it is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And to aspire to live quietly to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent upon no one. So most recently, in the, probably in the last month or so, my, my boys have roped me and my wife into playing Fortnite. Okay? We have allowed them, we, probably too much, to have a lot more device time and different things like that because the sports and stuff that they would normally be playing to get themselves outside still isn't, isn't happening quite yet. So we've given them a little leniency to play video games and they've roped dad into it with them. And I'm not very good. I am terrible. Um, and like, what they like to say is, dad, you're not sweaty. I guess sweaty means that you're really good at Fortnite. <laughs> so I'm not sweaty enough for them yet. So whenever we land in a certain place, what happens is you, you fall out of sky, you land in a place and you begin be battling all these other characters. And they oftentimes will tell me, um, hey, dad, let's go engage him. And I say, no, 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 we can't. We can't do it yet because I need more ammunition. I need more weapons. I need more shield. I need more med kits. I can't go out there yet and do this because I need more. Have you ever been there in your life where you have this task in front of you and you say, you know, I, I need to do this, but I can't do it unless I get more. I have to have more resources. I have to have more money. I have to have more time. I have to have more tools, whatever it means. I need more patience to deal with this relationship. I have to have more, more, more. Oftentimes when I would would look back on my Navy days, there would be tasks that they would give us. And they'd say, you need to do this and this and this. And then oftentimes it felt like they were telling us to dig a ditch that's six feet deep and six feet wide and here's a spoon to do it. And it 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 wouldn't be the best experience. And this is what Paul is telling them here. Hey, you need to thrive. You need to stay uh, strong and you need to stay ready. But in order to do that, you need more love. You need more. You need more. So let's, let's really kind of dive into that and let's see exactly what it is. So our, our big idea for today's message is living hope depends on my increasing love for others. Living hope depends on my increasing love for others. So if you are going to have that hope to stay strong to live ready, to thrive, it's dependent upon your increasing love for others. And in particular, your increasing love for each other in here as fellow believers. Okay? So I'm going to break this down. I got got three little ways where you can break this down so I can prove this statement to you. So first, the Holy Spirit is in us, and the Holy Spirit is the one that informs us of our hope. So he is at work in us to remind us of the love of God which strengthens our hope. When we give attention, so when we take attention off of ourselves and we put our attention onto others and we're loving others, we then give room for that Holy Spirit that's in us to work in our lives and not be hindered. So you are commanded to love one another, yes? So if you are not obeying the command to love one another, you are then hindering the Spirit from working in your life. So if you're hindering the Spirit from working in your life, you can't thrive. You can't stay strong. You can't live ready like you're supposed to be because you're hindering the Holy Spirit. So when we love others properly, when we get our eyes off of ourselves and onto the others in this room, we then allow the Holy Spirit room to work, to grow us, to continue that sanctification process. Secondly, love is the mark of a true Christian. Therefore, when you love others, it is produced in our lives. It serves us as that confirmingness that we are truly saved. So the Holy Spirit comes into us when we are saved. When we are loving others, that's an indication that we are being obedient to the, to the word of God. 
the Holy Spirit helps us to be obedient to the God, that's an indication that you're saved. For me, oftentimes in my Christian life, I need to remind myself of my salvation. Because when I fail and I fall and I fall into sin, the devil's right there on my shoulder reminding me of all that sin and how of a terrible person I am. And that if, if I'm really doing that, then I really can't truly be saved. And so when we love other people, it's that indication, you know what? You are saved. It's that confirmation. The Holy Spirit is working in you, Josh. It's going to help you. Thirdly, one of the means of grace that God has provided for us is the gospel and strength, the strength of hope inside this community. This local church was put together to provide you strength and hope. And when we are a community that's marked by love, that's going to help you thrive. It's going to help you stay strong. It's going to help you live ready because we are marked by that truth that God has put in us. I often say when I talk about life groups or something of that nature that the people that you experience here may often be the tangible experience of God's grace and love in your life. It takes that invisible love of God and makes it visible through his people. When we take our focus off ourselves and trying to meet our needs and the consumerism that comes into our Christianity and we start putting our focus on other people, you will in, in, in naturally in turn get your needs met. If we all come in his building with the intention of meeting everyone else's needs, then in, in natural byproduct of that is you will get your needs met. But when we all come in here self-focused, 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 nobody's going to get their needs met. And that goes for any of your relationships. Hey, you want to know maybe why your marriage is struggling? Maybe you're too self-focused. Focus on meeting the other person's needs. We have to meet each other's needs. So does all that make sense for our big idea? Awesome. So then that brings us to this question. Okay, so if living hope depends on my increasing love for others, how do I increase my love for others? I'm glad you asked because Paul gives us three things in this passage that's going to teach us how we can increase our love for others. So if you've seen your note, there's going to be three points. In front of each point, I want you to think like this. Maybe you want to write it down to help you remember it. My love increases when? My love increases when? Okay? So, number one, my love increases when? I learn love from God. My love increases when? I learn love from God. Let's go back to our text. That's what we're going to do. We're going to break it down uh, verse by verse and make sure that we are staying true to the text. Uh, verse 9 and 10, the first, first part of verse 10. Now concerning brotherly love. So, hey, now this topic of brotherly love. You have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God. For that indeed is what you are doing throughout all the, uh, uh, doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. So what Paul is saying here, if we look at this, hey, you don't even need me to write you to this. Concerning this topic of brotherly love, you don't need me to write this. This is outside of scripture. You don't even need me to do this because you're already doing it. And why you're already doing it, God has taught you. That phrase in there, taught by God, is a Greek word. I said in the first service, you guys probably don't even care, but it makes me sound cool, so I'm going to say it anyway. The Greek word is theodidakti. What that literally means is God taught. It's God taught. So this love that you have in you, you don't need me to write you and tell you about it because it's God taught. God taught you how to love one another. His point is that our love for others is something that comes outside the natural, that comes uh, to the natural Christian because they are taught by God to love. God has given it to you. Let me illustrate it like this. There are certain things that I never had to teach my kids. Right? I've never had to teach my kids how to love candy. It's just something that they've naturally picked up. I didn't have to say, you know what, you know, this is an acquired taste. Um, if you just do it right now, I promise you, as you get older, your taste buds are going to change. You're really going to love that candy. No, they've naturally loved that candy. And maybe because of the context of, of, of what they've lived in, there's other things that I've not teach them how to, that they need to love. I've never taught them to love sports. But they naturally love it because they've seen it in their father, and they've seen it in my, my life, and me watching TV and yelling at the TV. They've seen all that stuff because as a natural byproduct, now my kids love sports. And you as Christians, because you've been taught by God, 
Paul is saying, I don't even need to write. You don't need a 30-minute sermon. You don't need to join a, a, a class on eschatology and how to love. You don't need to write an, a dissertation on the Holy Spirit of God. You've already been taught this by God. I'm going to explain it to you using scripture if I can. Hopefully this will help. So in John 14, the Bible says this, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance that I have said to you. So when you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit of God. We learned that from Romans 8 9. If you don't have the Spirit, you're not saved. So when you get the Holy Spirit of God, here in John 14, it says that it teaches you all things. The Holy Spirit comes in you, the moment of salvation begins to teach you all things. And then in 1 John chapter 2, it says, but you've been anointed by the Holy Spirit. And then later on in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27, it says, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. And then if we follow scripture along a little bit later, we get to Galatians chapter 5, and in Galatians chapter 5, we see the fruit of the Spirit. Any of you biblical scholars, what's the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. So let's break it down like this. When you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God anoints you, begins to teach you all things. They have no need for me to teach you because the Holy Spirit's teaching you. And the first thing that the Holy Spirit teaches you, how to love. So what Paul is saying, I don't even need to write you and teach you this. I'm going to do it anyway because I want to remind you, but you've already learned how to love from God. So then, what's our responsibility? If God has already taught us to love through the Holy Spirit of God, what is our responsibility as Christians? We need to yield to the Spirit. If you want to continue and love others more and more, as we see in our passage, you need to continue to yield to the Spirit more and more. Scripture says it this way, Ephesians 5.18, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is a debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, or be controlled with the Spirit. Galatians 5.16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Controlled, when we're controlled by the Spirit, we are empowered to live accordance to His guidance. And He'll bring forth that divine fruit of love in our lives. How do you yield to the Spirit then? I think where a good place for you to start is when you get about your day, instead of waking up and just getting on with the hustle and bustle of the day, and letting all the uh, crap come at you, if I can say crap up here, I'll probably get in trouble for that one. When all that stuff's trying to come at you, maybe before you go out and wrestle your day, why don't you get on the face before the Lord? Say, God, I need to be controlled by your spirit. I need you today in my life. Because if I'm going to love others like you've called me to love, I can't do it on my own. I need the Holy Spirit of God to control me, control my mind, control my heart, control my tongue. Because if it's left up to my own devices, I'm going to say stuff that I shouldn't say. And then you maybe open up his word, let him speak back to you because you just spoke to him. Let him teach you. Yield to the Holy Spirit. So again, what Paul is saying here is, hey, you've already been taught love. You don't need me to write you, but I'm going to do it anyway because I want to remind you of these things. The Holy Spirit, you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's already taught you because you're already doing it, but you need to do it more and more. So I'm going to teach you anyway. Just kind of like you, probably looking up at me. Josh, we already know this. You don't need to teach me. Just be quiet and get off stage. But I'm going to do it anyway. So number one, we seen love increases when I learn love from God. Number two, I want you to see, so remember that phrase, love increases when I apply love in practice. I apply love in practice. So what I, one of the things that I love about Scripture is not only tells you what you need to do, but it also tells you how to do it. Okay, so here we see three things that are probably, I think, four things I have down here that Paul's going to see this is how you love. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive list of how we should love one another, but this is probably what was happening in the Thessalonican church when Paul got that report back from Timothy 
of, of what they were struggling with. This is most likely what he's seen that they needed to increase in. Okay? But I think that's still applicable for us here at City Light. This isn't just a letter to the Thessalonican church. This is a letter to the City Light church. It's still applicable today. So let's look for, back at our text. We're going to look at 10, the second half of 10 through 11. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire, here we go, to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we've instructed you. So this term, to, to do this more and more, literally means to exceed a fixed number. It gives us the idea of, of something that's super abounding, something that's overflowing. It would often be pertained or, or used to uh, talk about a river that's overflowing at its banks. The river is overflowing. So what the reference here, what Paul is trying to teach them is, hey, love needs to be overflowing out of your life. Love needs to be oozing out of the life. The love that you've received from the Holy Spirit of God ought to ooze out into your life with the other believers around you. And that's how you, may I just stop and say, that's how you live the Christian life? Is out of abundance of what God is doing in your life? What, what we do here on Sunday is an overflow of what God has done in our life all week long. We don't come in here and, and, and get our fix for the week and go about it. No, we come in here and worship because God's been working in our life all week. Philippians 1.9 says it this way, And it is my prayer that you, your love may abound more and more with, knowledge, with all knowledge and in all discernment. The work of the gracious spirit of God is in us and in response to our yielding to his control makes this love overflow out of the river banks of our lives. I love the way Peter said it in 1 Peter, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. That word earnestly means to strive with all your energy. Give it everything that you have. Hey, when it comes to this topic of loving one another, Hey, give it everything that you have. That's what Peter said. It's an athletic term. It's talking about, hey, let's put forth some effort. Let's do it. I used to, when I, when I would coach and, and I, I, I teach my kids basketball teams and, and, their, and their baseball teams, there's one thing I say, hey, there's one thing that you can, or there's two things that you can control out here. There's two things you can always control. You control your attitude and you control your effort. I think that's applicable to us too. Hey, we control our attitudes and we control our effort and how we love people. In verse 11, Paul puts some, some feet to this and gives us some actions and some steps for us to, to live this out in practical ways to allow it to be manifested in our lives. And the first one that we're going to look at here is to live quietly. We've seen that in our text, to live quietly. So this is kind of a play on words. It's like Paul saying, hey, I want you to be ambitious, not to be ambitious. So in, in other words, quietly basically means to be at rest. It was used to describe the, the silence after a speech. It was used to describe the, uh, the rest after labor. Have you ever had a really hard, exhausting day of work? And you get home and you just get a rest? And you, put my feet up. That's, that's what that word means here, to live quietly. Rest. Relax. It's okay. It's the peace after war. It was also used to describe tranquility or peace of mind, to urge to live a quiet and restful life. So we talked about the Thessalonians. One of their main questions had to do with end times. So what some of the biblical scholars believe what was happening here is they were getting so restless. They called it an eschatological restlessness. So they were so restless over this idea that Christ was coming. Have we missed it? Are our lives in order? I don't know what to do. They were, they were freaking out, if you can say that. So what Paul is coming to them and saying, hey, 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 relax. Yes, Christ is coming. He's returning. But it's going to be okay. Chill, bro. Relax. Quit hoarding toilet paper. It's okay. Right? It's okay. The 
Paul urges them to instead of allowing their excitement expectation to lead to them to neglect their daily duties, to let them use this enthusiasm to faithfully and fulfill those duties. I, I kind of liken it to, if, if you're anything like me, whenever I have an, uh, like an important event the next day or I have to do something important the next day, I'm restless all night. Like all night. Like even today when I knew I was, I was preaching. I've, I've known I've been preaching for a couple weeks now and I, last night I couldn't sleep. I was up all night. I wake up at 2 in the morning. Check my hours of time to get up. Oh, no, I got four more hours of sleep. <laughs> at 3 o'clock, oh, no, I got three more hours of sleep. And that's just, I just restless like that. Maybe it's a project you got to turn in at work. Maybe it's a, 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 a big date that you're anticipating. Something like that. It's that restlessness that they're dealing with. Or maybe it's when someone's coming over to the house at the last minute and the house is a mess. And you've got to pick up that house, right? And you're running around and you're trying to pick up the shoes and you're, you're yelling at kids. Like, like if it be for me, you're yelling at my kids, Zach, pick up your shoes. Noah, put your hat away. Georgina, why'd you make a mess in the toilet? <laughs> right? It's that franticness to try to get everything in order. She's not in here, so she can't say anything. <laughs> But what Paul is saying is into anticipation for the imminent arrival of our guests, we send in our home into turmoil. But he's saying, hey, do not succumb to the fanatical excitement that causes disorder or turmoil. Relax. Thessalonican Church, City Light Church. Yes, we're in some crazy times. Yes, the world's a mess. Yes, there's sin all around us. Relax. It's okay. God's in control. Right? The Thessalonican church, we just learned that Paul was ran out of there because of riots. He went in there and preached. Half the Jews believed, half didn't. Some of the Greeks believed, some didn't. There was disunity. They began rioting. They wanted to kill Paul and Silas. So there was a bunch of turmoil going on. And what does Paul urge them? Chill out. It's okay. Relax. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2, it says, First of all, then, I urge you that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. The opposite of this would be to be frantically running around, causing uproars and disturbances in their community. Proverbs 17.1 says that the opposite of quietness is the making of trouble or the causing of strifes. 1 Peter 3 and verse 4 says, Cause, calls this a meek and quiet spirit. MacArthur says, In anticipation of the Lord's returns, believers are to lead of peaceful lives, free of conflict and hostility towards others, which is a witness to the transformor, transforming power of the gospel. When you're running around all crazy and frantic, just like the rest of the world, it's kind of hard to see the differentiating factor that Christ is making in your life. Calm down. We've seen this all throughout history. People freaking out over things. The second thing that we see, so first off we see to live quietly. The second thing we see is to mind your own affairs. <laughs> to mind your own affairs. It, this one may be tough a little bit. What this means is that we should not be busybodies or gossipers. We shouldn't be meddling around in other people's business. What this is, what is not saying is, hey, you shouldn't. It's not saying, hey, don't love people. Don't correct your brother that may be falling into sin. What it's saying is, before you go meddling around in other people's business, why don't you make sure your business is correct? Remember the, the phrase we used to say when we were young, maybe these 90s kids? all up in your business. <laughs> Don't get up all up in other people's business, man. What do we like to do? We like to meddle around. I, I, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I, 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 was, I was saying, oftentimes when we're around my wife, or me and my wife are out and about, and you'll hear someone talking, and they'll, they'll be having a conversation, and, and someone's teaching something, and this and that, and I like to turn my, that's wrong. He's teaching that all wrong. I like to meddle. I like to get in other people's business, and I'm wrong for doing that. 
What we like to do is, is gossip about other people. We like to say, do you see what so-and-so is doing? Man, they're not even doing that right. <laughs> Man, can you believe that? Can you believe how they're living their life? You look at that sin. Meanwhile, we've got 10 little sins back here that we, that we have problems with ourselves in. We like to uh, up, up play what we do well and downplay what others people do well. Paul say, no, 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 no. Get your life in order before you go around getting into other people's business. 1 Peter 4.15 says, But let, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. In 1 Peter, it's putting meddling on par with murder, thief, and evil doing. So when you go around meddling in other people's business, you are on par with murdering or thievery. One who upro- uh, upsurps authority in the matters not within his province, it may, be, it may refer to the domineering interference of Christians in the affairs of the Gentile neighbors through excess of zeal to conform to them to the Christian standard. Proverbs 26, 17 says it this way, whoever meddles in a quarrel not of his own is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. So i give you an example. Our dog has, sometimes he gets ear infections and we have to clean his ears. Every time we grab his ears, he tries to bite us because he doesn't like when we grab his ears. That's what Proverbs says. One who gossips and meddles It's like grabbing that dog by the ear. You're going to get bit. You're going to get bit. Watch yourself. One way I think we can understand that this is not as a command to not care for others, but as a command to make sure our own life is in order before and instead of pointing out the lack of order in everyone else's lives. Hey, live quietly. Mind your own business. Next we see to work with your hands. To work with your hands. Now, what this is not saying is, hey, if, if you don't have a job where you work with your hands, if you're not involved in manual labor, then, then you can't love others. That's not what this is saying. What this is saying is, is you need to get to work. You need to not be reliant upon other people. What had happened here in the Thessalonican church when Paul got that report back, what he learned is a lot of the Christians here were so fanatic or you know frantic and in this upheaval and I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do that. They begin to even quit their jobs. And so what Paul is saying is say, no, 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 no. You need to work. You need to work with your hands. See, the Greeks believed that free men should not stoop to do manual labor. They believed that manual labor was below them. They believed that this was work that should be done by the slaves. But however, a lot of the early Christians came from manual labor. We learned this even with the disciples, right? They were fishermen, God had called them out of, this, out of that to follow him, but they came from that background. So therefore, Paul commanded the Thessalonians to be hard at work and to do their jobs. It was probable that many of the working class and slave laborers from among the Thessalonian converts had taken that attitude since they had become free in Christ. Perhaps they were no longer subject to their masters and the obligations of their jobs. The new believers focused on Jesus' return may have been intensified with this attitude towards work. And instead of supporting themselves through honest labor, some of the Thessalonians were likely dependent on others. So what Paul is saying here is if you quit your job and you're relying on the generosity of others within your church, you are not loving properly. Now, if people are truly in need and people truly maybe can't work, We as a church have an obligation to help them. But what he is saying here is those of you that have the ability to work and you're not working, get back to work. If you're going to love people properly, you need to chill out, mind your own business, and get to work. Get to work. That's what he's telling them. don't, Don't be leeches, don't be mooches, don't be living off of their generosity. You have the ability to work, so work. And by the way, may I say that the way we work is a reflection of Christ. So the reason why you work hard in your workplace is not just for that paycheck. It's not just because your boss told you to. 
is because you are a believer of Jesus Christ and people are going to see your work ethic and they're going to see something that should be different from their other co-workers. But oftentimes, as workers were lazy, we do just enough to get by and get that paycheck. No, we ought to be thriving in the workplace with the right attitude, ready to go to work, ready to conquer the day because Jesus Christ is a reflection of everything that we do. We need to quit compartmentalizing our Christianity to this room on Sunday. Your Christianity goes with you everywhere you go. And let your life be a reflection of that. Ephesians 4 and verse 28 says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands, so they may have something to share with anyone in need. Colossians 3.17 And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 2.23 Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. All of these are three infinitive phrases are close related. So everything that I just said, if I were to sum it somewhere like this, right? I think I may have already said it. What is Paul saying to everyone? Hey, 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 Thessalonica church. Be quiet. Calm down. Mind your own business. Get back to work. You may have heard that growing up from your parents. Hey, Josh, shut up. Leave your brother alone and go do what you're supposed to do. Right? You guys didn't hear that growing up? Maybe it's unique to me, but I know some of you parents say it because I've heard it. One commentary says it like this. Some members of the congregation have let their eschatological excitement get out of hand. They have quit their jobs, and Paul is telling them to calm down a bit and get back to work. Wearsby says it this way. The emphasis on quietness of mind and heart the inner peace that enables a man to be sufficient through faith in Christ. Paul did not want the saints running around and creating problems as they earned their daily bread. I think Paul maybe got some clarity a little bit later because when he penned 2 Thessalonians, he wrote this to them. For we hear some of you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. So these three things that we've seen here are what Paul's telling us that we need to practice in order to do, in order to get love more and more. Hey, we need more and more. You need more and more love. If you're going to thrive, if you're going to live strong, if you're going to live ready, you need to do more and more. Your love needs to increase more and more. How does my love increase more and more? Hey, these three things. Be quiet. Get out of other people's business. Get back to work. That's the, again, that's not an exhaustive list of how we love one another, but this is what the Thessalonican church was struggling with, so this is what Paul penned to them to do. So maybe what I would ask us to do as City Light Church, because I know some of this applies to this, because I'm up here when I was reading this, I was like, man, I need to do that, that, and that. Is maybe circle, where do I need to start? Where do I need to start? How do I love the people? If I'm going to thrive, I want to thrive. I hope you guys want to thrive in your Christian walk. I've learned love from God. I need to yield to his spirit. I need to find one of these things that I can start with and get better at. I'm going to circle it and I'm going to try. Well, how? By yielding to the spirit. You're not going to get there by your own merit because you're going to fail because you're a sinner just like I am. And you don't want to naturally love people. That comes from God and the Holy Spirit that's in you. So point number three. Again, so love increases when? Last one. I value love for influence. I value love for influence. So verse 12. So you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So first we've seen where love came from. It comes from God. And by the way, that's where love ought to always come from. When you... The world is going to be in your ear telling you what love is, how to love. Here's the definition of love. As Christians, we always come back to the standard, and the standard is God. 1 John chapter 4 says God is love. So if you want to learn how to love properly, 
Don't go buy some book on the self-help session. Open up the word of God. Okay, I went on a little tangent there. Let me figure out where I was at. <laughs> love comes from God. So we've seen where love comes from. We've seen how to love. And now we're going to see the why behind it. Why should we do this? Why should I love one another? Verse 12 again. So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent upon no one. So whenever you see the phrase, so that, in the Bible, that's, telling, that's giving you that, that purpose clause. That's telling you what it's there for. So that you may walk properly before outsiders. The word walk here is defining to the way we live our lives. The way in which we carry ourselves. The way, the way we, we go about our business is the way we're talking about here. So the way you live your life should have a reflection of the gospel. When you're living your life holy and proper, as we learned about last week, holiness and righteousness, how that leads to a thriving life. And when we're loving people properly like we should, as we're learning about now, it's going to draw people to the gospel. But when you're living a life that's contrary to this, when you're not loving people, when you're not living a holy life, when you're not living a righteous life, when you go to speak the gospel to people, it's going to fall on deaf ears. So your life may not communicate the gospel in itself, but what it will do is either help or hinder you when you verbally try to communicate the gospel. When you live a life that backs up the word of God, when you live a life that is showing love to people, when you live a life that's holy, as the kids say, it's going to hit differently when you preach the gospel. Right? If your life backs up what's in this book when you go and share that message to people it may hit home a little bit more but when you're running around all frantic and freaking out like everyone else around the world and you're getting all up in other people's business and you're talking about it talking about the way they live their life and how sinful they are but yet you're over here doing x y and z when you're not working and, and, and doing what you're supposed to in your workplace and then you go to your coworker and say, hey, can I tell you about Jesus? What do I need him for? My life's just like you. I don't need that. But when the rest of the world is freaking out and you're calm, and the peace of God has come over you, and you're trying to get your life in order, and you work hard, and you're diligent, and you have the right attitude, and that coworker comes up to you then, how are you so calm? Like, don't you see what's going on around us? You can say, yeah, I get my calmness from a man named Jesus. I'd love to tell him about, I'd love to tell you about him. Is your life a reflection of the gospel? When you get, maybe you're not even saved in here. Can I first and tell you, say, today's a wonderful day to get saved? Say, so, you know what, this, this love you're talking about, Josh, I've never experienced that. You can today. By putting your faith in Jesus Christ. He loves you as you are right now. And you just need to realize one thing, that you're a sinner. There's no way that you can atone for your sin on your own. You can't do it. You can't do it. But God loved you so much that he died on a cross to atone for your sins and make you a way to heaven. The Bible says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. That's a call for you. That's an invitation for you in this room today. You say, you know, I, I, I want to experience that. Do me a favor. After service, come talk to me. Come talk to Sam. Come talk to Albert. Come talk to Alberto. Come talk to Colleen. Come talk to Stephanie. We would love to open up the word of God and show you how you can be saved today. We'd love to do that. That would make our service if you would do that today. But let your lifestyle be a reflection of the gospel. Philippians 1.20 says, Only let the manner of life worthy of the gospel of Christ. When you get saved, people are watching you. People are watching you to see if it's real. Is it real in your life? We used to have someone in the church that used to go... Um, into downtown Burbank and he would paint himself in like all silver 
and then like he'd stand there like a statue, right? You've seen those people? And people walk by and they're like, is that real? Is that fake? Is that real? That's what your lost friends are doing. They're watching you. Is it real? Is that fake? Is that real? I don't know. I heard a story of about Gandhi. And Gandhi was intrigued by Christianity. He was intrigued about Christ. By the way, how could you read about Christ and not be intrigued by that? Christ is awesome. But what happened is Gandhi went to a a local church in India one Sunday morning, and when he tried to go in, he was refused entry. And they said, this church is for high caste Indians or for whites only. You're not welcome. Gandhi was not a high caste Indian. He was not white. So he was not allowed entry into that church. Later in Gandhi's writings, he penned down, I would be a Christian if it wasn't for the Christians. And I hope when we look at our lives, that's not what people say. I would be a Christian if it wasn't for Josh. Because the way he treated me, the way I watch him treat his brothers and sisters, he doesn't serve them. He doesn't love them. He's critical of them. Yeah. Hey, do your lost friends hear you talking critically about your local church? Uh, Why would they ever come? Yep. If you have a critical spirit, I promise you one thing, that's not from God. That's right. yeah, that's right. Your critical spirit is from Satan. You better watch yourself. The unsaved might not understand the nature and the blessings of the Christian life. They may not believe the Christian doctrine. They may not ever choose to become a Christian, but are fully, but are able to fully appreciate the difference between order and confusion, idleness and diligence, and in the lives of the professed followers of the gospel. People can argue doctrine with you all day long. The atheists have read all these books on how to rebuttal your doctrine and your Christianity, what they can't argue is a changed life. When they say, Josh used to do all this stuff. Why don't you do it no more? Right? I've had that in my life. There's been parts of my life where people have seen me in some filth. And right now, because they haven't seen maybe the way I've changed, my testimony wouldn't ring home there because they've seen me in some nonsense and some straight up evilness. But if they begin to see the change, why don't you do that more? Why don't you do that no more? Why don't you do that no more? Then you can, they can't argue that because you're changing. The gospel is changing you. Second Tim, or First Timothy 5.8 But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the face and is worse than an unbeliever. That's going back to that clause in verse 11 that we say, be dependent upon no one. Or verse 12, rather. Be dependent upon no one. Second Thessalonians 3.10 says it for this. For even when you, we are here with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So again, if I were to summarize all this up, I think it's clear that Paul's point was that our love manifested in our lives by living quietly, minding our business, and work hard influences the people around us, both in the church and outside the church. When we, when those, when we influence those outside the church by living in such a way that doesn't our hinder our witness to the lost. 1 John chapter 4 says this. It says that no man has ever seen God. We've never physically seen God. But people get a glimpse of God by the way in which we love each other. Read it for yourself, 1 John chapter 4. No man has ever seen God. But they will get a witness, they'll get a sneak peek of what God's like by the way we as believers love each other. How do we do that? We learn it from God. We live quietly mind our own business, 
We work hard. We chill. We relax. We live with the peace of God. So for conclusion, going back to our big idea, living hope depends on my increasing love for others. I hope you guys seen that. I hope how you've seen that how our loving others is going to help produce that, that ability for us to thrive, that ability for us to stay strong and live ready, that ability for us to have that hope that other people see and need. On the back of your handout, we have our learning to live. We have three learning to lives. Here at City Light, we don't want to just come here to learn to learn. We want to learn to live. I just talked for 45 minutes or whatever the time was, but it means nothing if you walk out these doors and forget it and don't apply it to your life. Same thing with your Bible reading. You can read it all day long and get fat heads, but if it's not becoming applicable and living it out in your life, you're missing the point. The ultimate point of this book, okay, I love the Word of God. I love it. The ultimate point of this book is not for you to just read it. The ultimate point of this book is to make you like Christ. Yes. Amen. And it can't make you like Christ if you're not willing to apply the things you're reading. Okay? So learning to live. Number one, how has God taught me his love? Hey, just make a list. Jot it down. How's God taught me his love? He's taught me his love. Obviously, we learned today about the Holy Spirit of God. God is in me. When I got saved, I got the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God has anointed me. The Holy Spirit of God is teaching me all things. The first thing I learned is the fruit of the Spirit is the Holy Spirit is teaching me love. That's one way God's taught you his love. How else has he taught you his love? Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's the, the people around you. Maybe it's the word of God itself. I don't know what it is. Write down a list of how God's taught you his love. Two, what influences lead me away from love? What's going, what influences in my life? Maybe it's people, maybe it's something you're reading, maybe it's TV, maybe whatever it is. What influences are leading you away from loving properly? Number three, which outsider needs to know I'm in process? Hey, it's okay that you're not perfect. You know that? This is a sanctification process. You get saved, maybe you're here. We just talked about end times, the return of Christ is there. That's when we're going to be perfected. But each step along the way, you'll be moving closer to there. You may get stuck here a little bit. Hard to get over this sin. Stuck here, God's going to chisel away, but eventually you're going to go closer, closer. It's okay for people to see that you're in process just like that. Okay? Or maybe there's a person that, like I talked about, there's, there's people that have seen me in my filth, and I know that I'm afraid to witness to those people because of the way they've seen me. Maybe, I, maybe you have someone in your life like I do and I need to go back to that person and be like, hey man, I've been withholding this gospel from you that has changed my life and has the ability to change your life because I'm ashamed. And here's how God's changing me. You want to come along on the journey with me? Whatever it is, I hope those help you. Take those away. Um, that's all we got today. Let's pray. We're going to get back and we're going to sing some more about that living hope. Will you pray with me? Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the word of God.